So sometimes just this investigation of our own minds when we find ourselves reactive, that becomes like a, that can become an invitation for us to look back inward rather than to keep, you know, in the blaming mode outside. Because the freedom, the liberation is going to come from unhooking our own minds. You know, it's not necessarily going to come from changing the world. Welcome to the Joseph Goldstein Insight Hour. This podcast is an expression of our shared interest in self-discovery. Join Joseph as he shares his deep knowledge of the path of mindfulness. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Joseph. The question I'd like to address this evening is how we can stay open and responsive to the many challenges, both in our own lives, individually and collectively in our society, in these rather challenging times, without becoming overwhelmed or drowning in the difficulties that are arising. As we start paying attention to the situations we face, the difficult situations, again, both collectively and individually, two qualities of mind uh, emerge as being particularly effective in working with these difficulties. And these are the qualities of equanimity and compassion. Usually in meditative circles, um, and probably in the larger world as well, we usually hear more about compassion than equanimity. You know, because all, almost all, or most spiritual traditions value compassion uh, and its cultivation. Equanimity is a more subtle and perhaps often invisible quality of mind, invisible practice in our lives. And yet these two together, equanimity and compassion, in perhaps a not obvious way, are very intimately connected. connected. Um, So what is equanimity? It's the mind space of impartiality, that is a non-reactive easefulness of mind that is open to seeing the whole of different situations and experiences. The poet Rilke wrote some beautiful lines about this possibility of seeing things as a whole. He was talking about interpersonal relationships but it really applies to all of our experience. So this is what he wrote. Once the realization is accepted that even between the closest people, infinite distances exist, a marvelous living side by side can grow up for them. If they succeed in loving the expanse between them, which gives them the possibility of always seeing each other as a whole and before an immense sky. Yeah, I just find that the image of that is so beautiful. You know, it's that possibility of stepping back and seeing the other as a whole before an immense sky. So we might say that equanimity is like that expanse, like that space that holds everything that holds all the world, you know, and it gives us the opportunity to see each other and all situations as a whole before an immense sky, before the immense space of our minds. 
So now you're going to have to pay particular attention because the next sentence has a triple negative. <laughs> so this is a trigger warning. <laughs> this non-reactive spaciousness does not imply non-discernment. The non-reactive spaciousness does not imply non-discernment or a state of vague confusion. Equanimity is a mind state that is open, that is clear, that is bright. And in its non-reactivity, it helps us see things clearly. When we're caught up in reactions to things, we're not seeing things as a whole. You know, we're seeing things through the lens of partiality. Because equanimity allows us to see, to hold the whole of another person, the whole of a situation, it's the basis then for investigation. It's the basis, equanimity is the basis for discernment, for wise discernment and skillful skillful responsiveness. It's precisely because we're seeing things clearly and as a whole that we can really assess the situation with tremendous clarity. And it's the understanding, and this is kind of a phrase from the Taoist tradition, that non-action is not inaction. So non-action means that we're not reacting to things but that does not imply inaction. It doesn't imply that we don't respond. So the question then is, how do we cultivate equanimity, both in our meditation practice and in our lives, in our daily lives, with all the busyness and the challenges of them? Realizing how quickly, as you undoubtedly have seen, how quickly our minds can become reactive, whether to pleasant things or unpleasant things. So there are a variety of um, practices and reflections which I found particularly helpful in establishing and coming back to this mind space, this open space of the equanimous mind. So one way of exploring this is through different ways of reframing our experience. In difficult situations, whether it's a difficult situation with a person or a larger situation in our lives, there are a couple of questions which might extricate ourselves from the quagmire of our conditioned and habitual reactions. And it is like a quagmire. We're we're kind of sunk in these habit patterns. So I'll give you a few examples of possible reframing. Quite a few years ago, I was at an IMS board meeting, and it was particularly contentious. Now I even forget what the issue was, but I do remember the contention, is that a word? Um, And people were really attached to the views, and I was really attached to my view, which was, of course, the correct one. (laughs) But at a certain point, you know, I was feeling the tension in the room and the the tension and suffering in myself. And so it prompted a kind of uh, interest to, in my mind, "Well, well, what's going on here? And I simply asked the question of myself, why do the other people feel the way they do? Which never dawned on me to ask. I just knew their view was incorrect. (laughs) But when I asked the question, well, there must be a reason they're holding that view. It's like the mind expanded a bit. You know, and I began to see things from their viewpoint. And it really eased that sense of polarity, of conflict. And then the following question came, well, what can I learn from this situation? So it's a very simple reframing of what had been a really difficult 
experience actually into a vehicle for opening my mind, for becoming more equanimous, for understanding other points of view from two simple questions. So it's not difficult to do. It's simply difficult to remember to do in the heat of our attachment to our own views. We can also begin to explore what I mentioned earlier um, in the morning, um, the connection between thought and emotion, which I just find so fascinating to see how a thought arising in the mind can so easily trigger a quick emotion, instantaneously. A certain thought, and there's some kind, often, of an emotion associated with it. So it's exploring the relationship between thought and emotion, and also, as I talked about earlier, uh, exploration of the very nature of thought itself. You know, what is a thought? So again, as just an example of all this, <clears throat> later this year I'll be teaching a short retreat at Garrison Institute in New York. And sometime when I was on retreat, myself, self-retreat, they sent an email saying, would you please write six, seven hundred words describing the retreat? And I didn't really want to do it. <laughs> it, it felt like just extra work. The course was already full. You know, it's not that they needed to publicize it. Uh, but there was an there was a, uh, order response on my email, you know, that these are not being saved. Contact me afterwards. Sometime later, I got another email from them. Please write the 600 words. So then I was sitting in meditation, and I thought of this, and I was getting really irritated, you know, and annoyed. And so I was writing this response in my mind, conveying my annoyance. <laughs> uh, you know, but then, because I was meditating, I, I also became interested. Well, what's, why am I getting caught in this? You know? And so I just started looking and, and looking into my own mind. And I realized that the thought about you know, what they were asking and my response were just thoughts. That's all. They were just empty thoughts. And I realized that I could respond very simply, I'll pass on this one. That's all. You know, I didn't have to write an email telling them what jerks they were. <laughs> it's just, I'll pass. And it was so, as soon as I kind of just settled in, this is just a thought. You know, they're just asking for something. I don't want to do it. I don't have to get involved in that annoyed reaction. Because who was suffering from that? They weren't. <laughs> you know, I, was, I was the one who was suffering. So sometimes just this investigation of our own minds when we find ourselves reactive, that, becomes like a, that can become an invitation for us to look back inward rather than to keep you know, in the blaming mode outside. Because the freedom, the liberation is going to come from unhooking our own minds. You know, it's not necessarily going to come from changing the world. So when we're feeling uneasy or reactive in some way, it also can be helpful to experience what is the emotion that's underneath the reaction. And a good example of this was Devin's angst about not getting the gold medal. And just so you know, I did give him a gold medal when we went to the teacher room. <laughs> so he got his medal after all. <laughs> but the mind state underneath, you know, what was feeling the resentment and the annoyance and the irritation, you know, of seeing somebody else get the gold medal, was really a very strongly conditioned mind state in all of us, which in Pali is called mana. And it's usually translated as conceit. But conceit not in the way we use that word in English, 
Conceit here or mana means the comparing mind. Every time we're comparing ourselves with other, and it can be we're comparing ourselves feeling inferior, feeling equal to, feeling superior to the other person, any comparison at all is the mana, is the conceit of I am. I am relative to someone else. You know, I'm better than, I'm worse than, I'm equal to. It doesn't matter because in each of those cases we're reinforcing that sense of self, that sense of I. It's helpful to know that this defilement, this comparing mind, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, uh, is very deeply rooted. In the Buddhist psychology it's said that it's not uprooted until the final stage of enlightenment. So even after desire is uprooted, even after aversion is uprooted, which would be huge things, conceit is still there, mana is still there. That tendency or that habitual pattern of comparing and this sense of I am goes very deep. So it's going to come up and be there probably for quite a while. A transforming uh, attitude with regard to both conceit, mana, and all the other defilements is when we go from seeing them arise and then either judging them or judging ourselves for the fact that they're arising. At a certain time in practice, we actually can feel delight in seeing them because we would rather see them than not see them. You know, and so now when I see conceit, this mana arise in the mind, it can be about some very little things or sometimes some big things, but any kind of comparing at all. Oh, mana, so glad to see you. <laughs> <laughs> but this is with humor, not with aversion. You know, but it's the seeing of it. That's what brings the joy. You know, because we're no longer we're no longer caught up in it. We're no longer identified with it. So it's going to come, but it's our relationship to it. It's our attitude about it that either entraps us or liberates us. So another reflection that helps support greater equanimity is really realizing that much of what happens in our lives is outside of our control. Although it's hard to believe, we are not actually the governing center of the universe. I know, it's a shock. (laughs) But there are a lot of things outside of our range of influence that we have no control over. Everything is arising out of a very complex multitude of causes and conditions. And sometimes it's an arena in which we can exercise some influence, but many times it's not. So just a very simple example. You go to the airport, check in, flight delayed, one hour, yes, one hour, Delayed, two hours, three hours. Have you been in that situation? And it's very interesting to watch people's reactions. You know, because there's a whole range. And you can see some people taking it very personally, (laughs) as if the airline is targeting them, you know, and delaying the plane. It's a completely impersonal situation. It's outside of our control. Why get upset? But we do. You know, it's, a, it's a common response. But that's like holding on to a hot burning coal. Well, I should be holding on to this, you know, because they're doing something to me. But meanwhile, who's burning? <laughs> We're the ones who are burning. And so just to realize in various situations... to realize and to investigate and to see, okay, is this something that I actually can influence in some way or not? 
And if it's beyond our range of influence, can we rest in equanimity? These are the causes and conditions which gave rise to this. You know, there's some mechanical problem with the airplane. Do you really want to get on it? <laughs> you know? And it just, it just allows us to settle back in a more equanimous, non-reactive mind. We're more at peace. So this is a simple example, but it's the same understanding that we can apply to more challenging situations. You know, when we begin to understand the causes and conditions behind even bigger things, you know, in our lives or in society, and see where can we interact meaningfully and where not, where it's beyond our capacity. So there's a very interesting implication of this realization. And that is, the more we let go of the illusion of being in control, the more clearly we see what causes and conditions will give rise to that which fulfills our aims. Do you follow? You know, when we're seeing something clearly, then we can see, oh, is there something I can do in this situation or not? If we're caught up in our, in our reactivity, thinking that we should be able to control things by our will, we're not going to understand really what will be effective. Another great support for equanimity is, of course, mindfulness itself. When we, when we become mindful of our reactions, when we become mindful of the ways that we're reacting to different difficulties. So just one example. Quite a few years ago, I was teaching uh, a retreat for law professionals. So there were law students, law faculty, I think maybe even a couple of judges were in there. And one, I think it was a second or third year law student, said something really interesting. He said, you know, the law can often be a, lit a litiginous process, you know, oppositional. And he said, in that process, in the intensity of the process, he needed to get angry in order not to feel fear. I thought that was really interesting. And it points to one of the basic teachings of the Buddha, and which is to look at all the strategies we've developed for avoiding unpleasant feelings or emotions, or pain. The mind is the mind defaults to whatever patterns we had, and for him it was defaulting to anger. You know, as a way of avoiding fear. And so we had a discussion. I suggested the possibility of learning to accept the feeling of fear, that as we talked about, that it's okay to feel It's unpleasant, but it's okay to feel it. And as we get into the acceptance of that, then we don't need the anger to help us avoid it, because we're already there, and then we can employ actually a more useful strategy for the situation. So sometimes it's just that mindfulness of what's underneath which helps us come back to equanimity. So just another example of this, and it points to the possibility of once we actually are accepting and mindful of the difficult emotion, in this case fear, but it could be any other, when we're mindful and accepting of it, we realize that it's possible to act even as we're feeling it. So again, years ago I was in Hawaii. Did I mention the hike to Kalalau here? Okay, so on the island of Kauai, the North Shore, the, there's a hike, an 11-mile hike into Kalalau Valley. It's a remote valley and extraordinarily beautiful, but a very intense hike. You know, it's up and down and up and down, steep. And so we get to the valley, and I'm with some friends who grew up in Hawaii, and there are big cliffs. And this friend who lived there, he said, oh, let's climb the cliffs. <laughs> I looked up. <laughs> 
was not the first thing that occurred to me. <laughs> but I was much younger then, and he wanted to climb the cliffs. There was a lot of fear. I mean, I, I was really afraid. It was, it was a cliff. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Handholds and footholds. And you know, I didn't really have a lot of experience with that. But as I say, you know, being young and he wanted to do it, so I did it. And it was very interesting to see for myself that even though the fear was there the whole time up, you know, it's not that it went away, but even in the face of fear, I was okay enough with feeling the fear that it didn't have to stop me. You know? And so that's a big lesson. Because when we're accepting of it, then it no longer is a limitation. Because we say, yes, this feeling here is here, it's unpleasant, I don't like it, but it's okay. And in the okayness then, we can act in whatever way we choose to act. So that was, that was really an important life lesson. Fear and other emotions like that do not have to limit us. So this is a little side point, but it comes out of that Kalalau hike. So for 11 miles, we were going up and these very expansive views of the coastline and the ocean, and it was fantastic. And then down steeply into the, to basically the jungle, the rainforest, where it was all dark and enclosed, couldn't see anything. And then up. And then down. And it's 11 miles of this. It was, it was extremely, for me, rigorous. So this is an example of our meditation practice. <laughs> because people sometimes come to the practice with the idea that, oh yes, it's just going to be a straight line up to bliss and liberation. <laughs> I'm sure you're disabused of that idea by now. It's up and down and up and down. But just as in the Kalalau hike, the going up and down and up and down, it was always moving forward. You know, I was getting closer to the goal of the valley, even in the going up and down. Practice is just like that. There's ups and downs and ups and downs, but if we stay mindful through it, the slope of that curve is going up. Any one experience may be in that open expanse or down in the dark rainforest of our minds. But if we stay mindful, even as we go through the ups and downs, we're proceeding towards the goal of liberation. It's very helpful to remember that. So we don't get caught in the attachment to the big expanse of view or aversion to the times when it's difficult. You know, mindfulness is what carries us forward through those ups and downs, and then we're always heading towards liberation. Equanimity also grows. There are so many ways, you know, of developing this. It also grows from an increasing awareness of impermanence. And, of course, we've talked a lot about this, and we all know intellectually that things change. So this is not an esoteric truth. However, we often are not living from this place of understanding, even though conceptually we know it's true, but we're not acting we're not living our lives as if it's true. Because if we were, we would not be clinging at all. So awareness of impermanence can happen on a lot of different levels. And on each of these levels, it helps bring us back to the equanimous mind. So in meditation, sometimes the impermanence can be seen very microscopically. You know, as we get more concentrated, we just see moment after the, the process of change happening in a microscopic way, moment after moment. This rapid flow of changes is always taking place. So just as an example, you know, you hear... What is that? Oh, it's the sound of the bell. As if the sound is one thing. Is it one thing? how many vibrations and overtones and undertones and whatever else is going on. 
so many changes, microscopic changes happening all the time, and that's true of everything. The breath is not one thing. A step is not one thing. Now, how many different sensations in one in-breath? How many di different sensations in the movement of a step? So the more we see this impermanence, the more we see this change, it helps us be non-reactive to what's happening because we see it's just continually changing. For many of the ordinary decisions in our life, awareness of impermanence can help free us from attachment to our preferences. And I found this a lot, and it's really been a source of great ease. Just for example, you know, you're going out with some friends. What to do? Where to go? Which restaurant to eat at? I found that remembering for myself, that whatever we decide will soon be over. <laughs> you know, and that five minutes after it's over, it's gone. You know. And it makes it easier and more joyful to just then do what makes other people happy. You know, because I realize for me, it, it's not going to be the source of my everlasting happiness if we go to this place or that place. And just remembering this, so then it's just, okay, whatever you'd like to do, I'm happy to do. You know, and so it just becomes a very joyful uh, way of relating. So I want to read uh, the two stories in this regard. I guess the first one I'll just... Uh, happened when I was practicing in Bodh Gaya in India. And I had been practicing for quite a while by then. And so my practice was in a really nice space. You know, very uh, still and quiet. And, and Munindra, my teacher, had the habit of coming by with every Western traveler who came to Bodh Gaya, not interested in meditation, they were just, you know, travelers. Oh, come meet Joseph. <laughs> so I'm sitting in my room, really, you know, in deep practice and quiet. And this kept happening. He kept doing this. And I could hear Munindra's footsteps. And, oh, no, this is my teacher. <laughs> yeah, don't be coming to see me. But he kept coming. So at a certain point, I realized I'm getting all upset by this, you know, and the upset is what's disturbing the practice. And so when I realized that, you know, I'm sitting and it's really still and quiet. He's coming. I'd get up from my seat. I'd interact with this person, be friendly. They'd leave. I'd go back to sitting. No problem. You know, and it's just interesting knowing that that was just an impermanent situation that was arising out of my control, you know. But knowing or finally realizing this is just like a, a few momentary uh, you know, little bumps in terms of, you know, activity. Not a problem at all. And it was very interesting to see that. We don't have to be disturbed by these kind of difficulties if we realize it's all part of the passing show. So I'd like to read, uh, this is a, a few lines from the French essayist Montaigne. Uh, and he's talking about uh, the nature of this profound friendship he had with this other person. And he describes the nature of the friendship. And it really has to do with the friendship was so deep and the love was so deep. So this is how he described it. But I find it really quite remarkable. In a truly loving relationship which I have experienced, rather than drawing the one I love to me, I give myself to him. Not merely do I prefer to do him good than to have him do good to me. I would even prefer that he did good to himself rather than to me. It is when he does good to himself that he does most good to me. If his absence is either pleasant or useful to him, 
if his absence is either pleasant or useful to him, then it delights me far more than his presence. I mean, that's an extraordinary expression of love and equanimity. You know, where we really let go of attachment to our own wants and see that our happiness can really be in the happiness of others. Uh, so this is expressive of a famous line from uh, in the Zen teachings, in Zen tradition, the third Zen ancestor. And it, it opens up, uh, the great way is not difficult for those not attached to their preferences. You know, and so we, we all have preferences about things, but are we attached to them or not? And if we're not attached, they happen fine. They don't happen fine. Uh, and it really creates a tremendous spaciousness and ease of mind. So the last way I'll mention for the developing of equanimity is expanding our time and space perspectives. And this can happen on uh, different levels. There's the expansion of historical time. So an example which I've used very often over the years, and I could think of others, but I love this one. So my apologies to those who have heard it 500 times. Some years ago, I read a book about Genghis Khan. And it was extraordinary. I mean, I found out things I you know, didn't at all know about it. And he was a remarkable person. And he ended up conquering most of Asia and some of Europe. So his impact on the world was huge. How many times today did you think of Genghis Khan? <laughs> I'll bet not once. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> and we don't even have to go back to Genghis Khan, go back, you know, a hundred years. So these things which are so intense and so problematic, and, but in the long sway of history, there's a very different relationship to it all. You know, and we can hold what's happening with greater equanimity. So if historical time doesn't do it, think of geologic time. You know, in four and a half billion years, the sun's going to collapse or explode or whatever it's going to do, and goodbye, Earth. From that perspective, <laughs> your knee pain doesn't mean much. <laughs> you know, we just, we just give our minds a larger perspective on what's happening. There's also a cosmic perspective, and this, is, this has more to do with space than time. And I want to read something which I just find so beautiful. I know that you're familiar with Carl Sagan's little writing on the blue dot. But this had to do with pictures taken from the Voyager spacecraft four billion miles away from the Earth taking pictures of the earth. And all that can be seen in this picture is this tiny, faint, pale blue dot. From that perspective, that's what the earth is. So this is what Carl Sagan says. Look again at that dot. That's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, economic doctrines, every hunter, forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, Every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. 
Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph, they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabits, inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds. The earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit, yes. Settle, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Yeah, it's so beautiful. And if we can enlarge our perspective and not be so caught up, you know, in reactivity to the things that are happening moment to moment, just that vastness of perspective, you know, inspires us to treat each other more kindly, to take care of the planet. Uh, so this is, this is a reflection that we can all engender in ourselves. You know, it's not some esoteric, great meditative insight. In fact, you could Google Carl Sagan, Pale Blue Dot, and see the, the, pic, the image of it, and it's, it's quite something. You know, this tiny, tiny, you can hardly distinguish it. And this is all we know. So as we develop and practice equanimity in our lives, in all of these different ways, we also need to be aware of a hidden danger, because there is one embedded in all of this. And that is to be aware of what the Buddha called the near enemies of wholesome states. And that each of the wholesome states has a corresponding quality of mind that looks like it, but is not it. So the near enemy of equanimity is indifference. And the feeling of indifference can look like equanimity, but it is very different. Indifference is a withdrawal from experience. You know, it's a non-caring attitude. When you're indifferent, you don't care about things, about other people. It's a non-responsiveness to life. Very different than equanimity, which is an open, clear awareness of all the various causes and conditions that give rise to our current experience. And in this clear seeing, we're better able to discern where we can be effective, what wholesome states should be cultivated, what unwholesome states should be let go of, should be abandoned. We begin to see when there's equanimity rather than indifference where we can engage in a meaningful way. So the question for us then is, how do we mitigate tendencies towards indifference? Because they will come up and, you know, the equanimity can sometimes slide into indifference and unbeknownst to us. And we end up feeling in this very detached, uh, non-interested way thinking that we're still practicing equanimity. So it's really helpful to see this clearly. It's precisely in this investigation and seeing what can help prevent us from sliding into indifference that compassion plays such a critical role.
With equanimity, we have enough stability and openness of mind to see the whole of a situation and have the willingness to come close to suffering that may exist. Equanimity gives us the foundation, the ability to begin to approach the suffering without reactivity. And compassion is precisely or precisely arises out of the willingness to come close to suffering. But this is a challenge very often because we don't like to come close to suffering. You know, there's some kind of pain either in ourselves or in other people and the tendency very often is to avoid it. And I'm sure you can see that in your own practice. Something painful comes up is the first response, oh good, let me come close to this, let me feel it. Hopefully you get there pretty quickly, but it's not often the very first response. Difficulty, oh, let me pull back, which is going into indifference. Equanimity is precisely that foundation which gives us the strength, the stability, the evenness, and the willingness, okay, My mind's in a pretty open, clear space. I can come close to this. I can feel this. And that's precisely what gives rise to compassion. It's really important to watch our conditioned reactions. And to do this on retreat will help you do it when you are out in the world, in your daily lives to really watch your response to difficult situations, difficult experiences that arise. Do we stay open and investigate? Or do we pull back and withdraw and close off and contract? And I'm sure if you are noticing carefully, you'll see both both responses at play. It's very helpful to get very clear about this so that we know when we're contracting in the face of some suffering or difficulty and to really feel what that's like and to see very clearly when our heart and mind is open to the difficulty you know, and is willing to come close to it and to really see and know very clearly what that's like. Out of the ability to come close, what happens is that quite naturally, we develop a greater empathy for the person, the situation, for ourselves, you know, uh, that is experiencing some suffering because we're willing to be there, willing to stand in the presence of it. And out of this empathy, two compassion-inducing questions can arise. The first question is, in the face of suffering, how can I help? And that was the title of a book by Ram Dass and Paul Gorman back, way back, maybe in the 70s. And I love that title, you know, because it so captures the essence of compassion. It's like we're close to a difficult situation of suffering, and there's enough equanimity that allows us to come close to it, And out of that, the question, well, how can I help in this situation? The other question is, what can I do to help alleviate this suffering? And so it just prompts the compassionate response. Thich Nhat Hanh summed this up really well. He said, compassion is a verb. You know, empathy is the feeling of what somebody else is going through. It's sort of feeling and attuning to the suffering that may be there. But compassion implies an action, you know. It implies a responsiveness. And I like this articulation of it because very often we create some ideal of compassion as some heart-opening feeling that is splendid and, you know, vast and big and all of that. And very often we may not feel that at all. That responsiveness to suffering 
is not necessarily even a feeling, you know, or a particularly strong feeling. It's just we're in a situation, and if we're open and if we're close, there can be a natural responsiveness to that. If somebody's hungry, you feed them. It doesn't have to rest on some having some big emotion about it. It's just the natural response of an open heart. You know, and that open-heartedness is possible when there's equanimity, when there's not reactivity to the suffering. So do you see the connection between these two? It's like equanimity provides the stability of our minds and hearts to come close to the suffering so that it can be naturally responsive. So one way I sometimes express this is compassion is the natural activity of emptiness. And emptiness in this sense means emptiness of self. The more we can take the self out of the picture, compassion is the natural response to suffering. So just as equanimity can slide into indifference, compassion has its own near enemy, which we really have to be careful of because very easy to slide into it. And the near enemy of compassion is sorrow. You know, and that's often the response we have to big suffering in ourselves or in the world. Uh, but it's helpful to distinguish between the sorrow and sadness that can open the heart to the suffering that's there and the overwhelming sorrow that simply leads to despair. You know, in the face of big suffering, if we slide into the near enemy, you know, of sorrow, and it becomes overwhelming sorrow, and then just we become despairing about the situation, that doesn't help anyone. It's not a skillful state. It's not a wholesome state of mind. But sometimes we experience it, it's masquerading as compassion. You know, as we're feeling this, we may feel, oh, we're being so compassionate for it, but actually we're being overwhelmed. You know? So that's really very helpful. And you know, especially with people engaged on the front lines of social action that are really dealing right at the edge of you know, great challenges and great suffering you know, in society, one of the ongoing problems... And I've taught retreats for social activists and environmental activists, and one of the most common comments was about burnout. You know, people are engaged and their motivation is good and their heart is in the right place. They get burned out. Why? Because the compassion has slipped into overwhelm, you know, and then despair, and then it's not helpful. It's very interesting. Compassion is extremely interesting because even though it comes from coming close to suffering, the feeling of how can I help is uplifting. It, it's not a despairing mind state at all. It's an energizing and an uplifting feeling. So it's really important to just track our own responses and to watch just as, you know, to watch the danger of equanimity going to indifference, we want to watch compassion and the, the danger of compassion going to sorrow, to overwhelming sorrow. And that becomes the signal then that we've really moved out of that uh, ennobling quality of compassion. You know, compassion can manifest in a lot of different ways. So there's not just one, one route for compassion and action. It can manifest as generosity. Just taking, taking opportunities to be generous. You have the thought of giving something, and this is a practice I've really undertaken for years now, and I love doing it. The thought to give something arises, my practice is to do it, instead of second-guessing. Oh, that would be too much, or I may need it, or whatever, whatever the rationale is for pulling back. If the thought comes, do it. And it's really interesting. I've seen 
sometimes the thought is just a little thing. It just could be a phone call, you know, or helping in some little way. Sometimes it's been big things. I see this thought come up in my mind. Whoa, <laughs> this is big. <laughs> do I really want to do this? But because I've taken on a practice, I do it. And I've never regretted it. You know, it's always been a source of happiness. So that's one way of expressing the compassion that comes quite spontaneously in these thoughts. Sometimes compassion really comes and is, is manifest with tremendous courage and uh, determination. So some of you may know, and probably most of you know, of uh, the young uh, Pakistani activist Malala. An incredible story. You know, she was a Pakistani activist for female education. And in 2012, when she was 15 years old, some Taliban terrorists, because they're very opposed to female education, uh, tried to assassinate her and shot her. And actually she was very serious. She was in a coma for eight days, unconscious. Uh, and then she recovered enough and she uh, was able to go to the UK for treatment. Uh, and she, she recovered mostly. You know? And then from that, uh, she had been active before you know, as, as a young girl. And afterwards, people, this became a worldwide uh, phenomena, you know, her situation. Uh, and she created the Malala Foundation and really supporting education, education for all. That was, that was the mission. So this is, this is one of the things she wrote, you know, and just as a demonstration of the tremendous courage and determination because she was the recipient of continual threats to her life, you know, as she was engaged in this. She said, the terrorists thought they would change my aims and stop my ambition, but nothing changed in my life except this. Weakness, fear, and hopelessness died. Strength, power, and courage were born. I am not against anyone. I'm here to speak up for the right of education for every child. I want education for the sons and daughters of the Taliban and all terrorists and extremists. And it goes on. But, and, and since then, you know, she's done all this incredible work. And in 2014, at age 17, she was the youngest recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. This is a 17-year-old girl, you know, who transformed that intense situation of suffering and violence into a worldwide movement, you know, of helping young children get an education. And it's quite remarkable. And so to see that compassion can take many forms, sometimes it's just little things, sometimes it's really big things. And it's important to realize that there is no hierarchy of compassionate action. The field of compassion is limitless because it is the field of suffering beings. So there's no one way. We will all find our own way to be of help. How can I help? Depending on our interests, our inclinations, our talents, our abilities. And sometimes it is being in the front line of social action. And sometimes it could be sitting in a cave for your entire life with the aspiration to help awaken all beings. I think of the Buddha before his enlightenment, his many lifetimes as a bodhisattva sitting in a cave, you know? But we're sitting here as the result of all that work. So it's really important to understand and not to create a hierarchy of compassionate action. We'll all find our own way and we'll all contribute in whatever way we can. So as we learn to navigate the challenges in these times, you know, the challenges of our lives and all the suffering that's there in so many domains and arenas, very helpful to really deepen your exploration of the meaning and experience of equanimity and compassion. 
also recognizing they're near enemies so we don't unknowingly fall into them. And seeing how compassion and equanimity mutually support each other. You know, they're, they're inextricably connected. And we need a great humility on this path. So the Dalai Lama wrote something. Changes in attitudes never come easily. It's a wide round curve that can be negotiated only slowly not a sharp corner that can be turned all at once. It comes with daily practice. So it's realizing that as we just understand, at whatever level we do, of the value of these two qualities of mind, to have a humility in our practice of them, that it's a gradual process of developing these qualities in ourselves. This is expressed in a short haiku by Isa. New Year's Day, everything's in blossom, I feel about average. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) Because average reminds us that at some basic level, all of us are average. (laughs) We're just, just people going about our lives. But it's understanding that the potential for growing Equanimity and compassion and wisdom, that potential exists in all of us. And that becomes the basis, the foundation of our aspiration and our practice. So let's just sit for a couple of minutes. 